What he represents is patriarchy. We're here to do work as men, as patriarchs. There's nothing more natural than being a father. Welcome back to the 21 Convention 2019 Patriarch Edition of Orlando, Florida. Our next speaker is a returning speaker to the 21 Convention. He first spoke last year in Orlando at our event back in October. He is the author of The Tactical Guide to Women, How Men Can Manage Risk in Dating and Marriage. He's actually the author of several more books beyond that too, including a few for women. Our next speaker is also a, he's been a clinical psychologist in Denver, Colorado for a few decades. He was one of my favorite new speakers last year, and I'm really glad he's here. He's a father of at least one, I think he might even have more kids than that, proud patriarch. Anyway, without further ado, please help me welcome to the stage, Dr. Sean T. Smith. Let's come back, sir. Good to be here, thank you. Good morning. Man, Hunter got me fired up this morning. How you feeling? And how about George? George is, um, George is the kind of guy you meet him for the first time, you feel like you're meeting an old friend. Um, so I'm gonna try to add something useful to this today, uh, maybe give you some skills that you can take home and try out on your little ones. And uh, if you'll indulge me, I have to rely on my notes cards a little bit because I didn't prepare quite as much as I wanted to, but in my defense, I was drunk and uh, failed to see how that's my responsibility. So I'll do the best I can here. My wife, uh, I make her a little edgy sometimes because I'll approach her with these questions and she knows that I'm looking for something but she doesn't know exactly what I'm looking for. And I hit her with one the other day. I said, what is the mothering instinct? And she said, you know, she, she got kind of tense because she knows I'm after something. And she said, well, I, I guess it's the desire to bond with your children and, and so that you'll keep them alive. And I said, okay, well, let's make it more specific. Let's, let's say that if there's a mothering instinct that there must be some kind of evolved adaptations that get passed down through our DNA that lead to certain behaviors and traits that create this desire to uh, keep your, your child alive. And, and so what might those be? And the first thing she came up with was to create a safe and nurturing environment. And I think that was spot on, so she relaxed a little bit. And I, the reason I think that's spot on is because it's what I see among mothers, and it's what I hear in the culture, is that the mother's job is to create safety and nurturance. Now, how many people here think that there is a fathering instinct? I do. You don't hear much about it, really. You hear, you hear a lot about mama bear, right? but you don't hear much about papa bear, besides that toilet paper commercial. But I think that there is a fathering instinct, and... I think uh, one part of that is the instinct to provide. And this is something that's been under attack in our culture. It's, it's called patriarchal, it's called hegemonic, that we go out and we kill things and we bring it back to the cave and we feed our families and we become sort of the leader in, the, in that regard. And that is seen somehow as a slight against women in certain quarters. But there's an interesting paper that came out just earlier this year in this handbook called the Palgrave Handbook for Male Mental Health came out of England. It's a really good handbook. And one of the uh, chapters in that book talks about the fact that just the act of providing, going out and killing something and bringing it back, that that creates a series of neuroendocrine uh, responses within the body that lead to other behaviors that create bonding between father and child. So that's clearly one aspect of the fathering instinct. Another aspect that I've noticed because uh, a little bit about me, I, I've, as to, uh, Anthony mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist. I started off a long time ago just working with anxiety disorders because I like working with anxiety disorders because it's a very clear fix to them. And so a high success rate when you work with anxiety disorders. But also early in my career, I got really interested in relationships, this male-female thing and what makes it work and, and how to fix that. So over the years, there is this certain point of tension that shows up in my office on occasion between mothers and fathers. And it is this tension between safety and risk. I think another second big part of the fathering instinct is to allow our children to experience some of the friction in the world. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today is that, um, that 
innate understanding that fathers seem to have that, that we have to push against something to get stronger, to build character, to build resilience. It's sort of like astronauts when they go up into space and they don't experience gravity and they're not pushing against the earth. What happens to them? Well, their, their muscles atrophy. Their bones become less dense. It's, it's a real problem. It can last for years. It can, it can dog them for, for many years after they come back to earth. And fathers seem to understand instinctually that our children need to push against something. They, they need to experience the world, whereas mothers are generally trying to protect them from the world. And this is the tension that I see showing up. Um, we seem to understand better than they do that pushing against the world creates character and it creates resilience and it creates um, courage. So I want to tell you a little story in this regard. This is a, I'll tell you about a friend of mine that I went to high school with. He and I have been buddies for uh, 30-something years now. And this is one of my favorite stories, and he tells it better than I do. I'll, I'll do my best with it. But I want to tell you a little bit about our relationship. One of the reasons we connect is because our fathers were very similar. Our fathers were uh, older, than, older gentlemen when they had both of us, and they, they were similar in temperament, and they were very big personalities. But they were not the kind of fathers that were prone to giving a lot of guidance. You know, when you see the beginning of the old Andy Griffith show where they're, they're walking down to the lake together, father and son, and he's imparting some kind of wisdom that you can't hear because somebody's whistling, that that was not our fathers. They were great fathers, but that was not them. And the only reason I say that is to, to um, illustrate the point that my friend and I didn't get a lot of training. And so that makes this story about him all that much more poignant because clearly what he did with his children on, on a particular day day um, came from instinct, came from his DNA. And here's the situation. Um, he was, uh, this was about 20 years ago, he had a couple of kids, ages like six and seven. And so when you're six and seven, what are you doing? You're starting to go out into the world, into preschool, in your kindergarten. There's all this new structure and all these new rules that you have to try to contend with as you're a little kid. And he noticed that there was a little contention developing between him and his, his kids, a little bit of adversarial relationship, because what was happening is the morning routine was getting a little bit competitive. The way it usually worked was mom would go to work really early, and then he would gather up the kids, drop them off at school, then he would go to work. He had to be at work at a certain time. And so the tension that was developing was that the kids were starting to get resistant. Like they were starting to him and haw in the morning. They weren't getting dressed on time. They weren't brushing their teeth on time. And it was starting to encroach on his professional life because he was starting to run the risk of being late, which would threaten his ability to come home and with the prize at the end of the day. And as he saw this developing, this tension, um, he had a wonderful intervention. And when you think about, well, let me tell you what he did first. He went to them one morning, or actually it was one evening, the, the evening before one morning, and he said, we got a new plan for tomorrow. The plan is that I have to be at work on time. And so what I need for you, from you kids, is for you to be dressed and in the car and ready to go at 7.30, because I'm gonna leave at 7.30. And I hope you're with me, but if you're not, that's okay. You can stay home, and it probably won't be a very fun day for you because I don't know what you're going to do for lunch, and your teachers aren't going to be very happy with you, but you'll get through it. And so next morning rolls around, and, and he had even explained. He reviewed the clock with him. Like, this is what 7.30 looks like. We've got the, the minute down, hand down here, and we've got the hour hand right next to it, and we even have a digital clock. It's a different kind of clock. It has a 7 and a colon, and it has a 30. So he explained all of this to them, and he said about 7.25, you probably better be on the way to the truck. So next morning, 725 rolls around, and guess who's not ready to go? The kids are not ready to go. They're testing. And when you think about the world from a kid's point of view, this makes sense because they're thrown into this situation called life, and, and it's very confusing, and they're trying to piece it all together. Like, apparently, you're supposed to fold your clothes and put them in the drawer but then apparently when your friend steals your toy, you're not supposed to bite them. And all of these rules seem kind of arbitrary. And so it makes sense that they would test and try to find out what's solid and what isn't. So the next morning, they're testing and they're trying to find out what's solid and what isn't. And is my friend going to be solid? Well, 725, he notices that they're not ready. And he says, gosh, it's getting kind of late. Are you, are you two coming with me? Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll be there. 
you know, they're, they're really not attending to the urgency of the situation. 728, they see him grabbing his backpack and walking out to the car. And he's ready to leave them. Now, is he really going to leave them? No, he's got to see he's smart. What he did was he has a, a neighbor around the corner. We didn't have cell phones, but he had a neighbor around the corner who loved his kids. And he had talked to her the morning before and said, hey, if I come knock at your door at 732 tomorrow, can you go over to, the, to my house and make sure the kids are okay and we'll work it out from there. So he had the safety net in place and he was ready to go. So they see him walking out to the car. Now suddenly it's starting to get real. Their testing is yielding a result, and the result is that dad is serious, like he's actually going to leave us here, and it starts to register, and they start to get kind of activated and agitated, and, and I don't know what was said between them, but he picks up on their, their emotion, and he sees that they're starting to spin out of control a little bit because he thinks they're actually, they, they think he's actually going to leave them, which he is, and they don't know what to do because they're not dressed, and they're not ready for school, and my friend says, well, Here's an option. You know, we still have two minutes. If you can gather up your clothes and run out the door, I guess you could change in the car. And then he walks out. He gets in his car. He starts it up. He starts backing down the driveway. And this is the part that he tells better than I do. And what does he see in his rearview mirror? He sees these kids, pants in one hand, lunchbox. One kid drops his shoe, has to go back and pick it up. But they, they open the door and they pile in and they change on the way to, to school, and it was a success. Now, how, let me tell you about the, the tone of my friend. He's a very low-key kind of guy. And the beauty of this intervention is that there was no anger, there was no lecturing, there was no shaming. He was on their side the whole time. From the night before, he was their ally. Very low level of emotion. Now, they had a high level of emotion at one point, but he was always right down here. How would a mother typically handle this situation? High level of emotion, right? Begging, bargaining, pleading, anger, frustration. And you've seen this. You've seen this in the grocery store. You've seen the mother who says, I'm going to count to three. And then she counts to three and nothing happens. And then she has to count to four, whatever it is. And I'm sure that somewhere there are men who do that. But of all the dozens of women I've observed that with in the grocery store, I've never once, not one time, have I ever seen a man do that because we have different instincts. Now, is it because we're better parents than them? No, we're just different parents than them. We understand the value of friction. And what my friend did that day was he allowed the world to encroach on his children's life a little bit, but he did it in a very controlled fashion. Now, here's the beautiful thing about this instinct that we have to allow our children to experience friction. We very rarely need to be the source of friction. Some of our fathers were a little confused. They thought that they needed to be the source of friction. They needed to provide uh, anger and frustration and lecturing and shame. Some of our fathers didn't. My father didn't do that. But um, we don't usually need to be the source of friction because there's plenty of friction coming from the outside world. Now, sometimes they bump up against us personally and we then become the source of friction. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, a few years ago, my wife made me, uh, for my birthday, a big pile of beef jerky, and she went all out. She went to Whole Foods, got the best cut of meat, had them slice it thin. She marinated it all night, and then whenever I wasn't home, she was out at the smoker, cooking this up slowly, and uh, it, was a, it was a beautiful gift. This was easily like $75 worth of beef jerky, and uh, one day I went into the refrigerator to get some of this delightful spicy beef jerky and I noticed that the bag was pretty light and it turns out that certain nine-year-old daughter had been getting after this stuff like a ravenous wolf and so <laughs> she and I had a conversation because she had she had uh, affected me personally we had a conversation about being part of a family and consideration because don't get me wrong I would take a bullet for this kid but there's a pecking order with the beef jerky so we <laughs> We discussed it, and then I shared the beef jerky with her. Of course I did, because you know, she's the light of my life. So that kind of situation aside, we don't need to be the source of friction. And, and the beauty of what my friend did was he provided his, his little kids with three things. And if you take nothing else from my little talk today, take these three words, structure, warmth, and success. The structure that he gave his children was the clock, 
the car, and the clothes. That's it. Three things that they can manage. They didn't have to worry about putting gas into the car. They didn't have to buy food for their lunch boxes. They didn't have to provide their own clothes. They just had to manage those three age-appropriate things. He controlled everything else, and he allowed that much structure from the world to come into their lives. He didn't invent the structure. That's the structure of the world. The warmth he gave them was being on their side from the beginning, from the night before, saying, I think you kids can do this. I'm with you. I know we've been having some trouble, but I'm on your side. And even <laughs> toward the end, when things were starting to melt down, he gave them the third component, which was success. When they were starting to melt down, when they saw, thought that they were down and out, he gave them a little solution, an age-appropriate solution. You can grab your stuff and you can get into the car. So even when they thought they had failed, he allowed them to succeed. That was such a beautiful intervention. It's one of my favorite stories, and this is why, because he gave them those three elements, structure, warmth, and success. And it, it was such a, a beautiful lesson that he gave them that day because he gave them a couple of very important things. Number one, he gave them a little lesson in character that it's really important that we keep our word with people. And as I've watched his kids grow up, they're in their 20s now, they're both doing great things. One of them has, is off to a stellar career in the military, and, and I have to imagine that some of that ability to thrive in that environment goes back to that random Wednesday morning when he gave them this gift of character, little gift that just carried on. And the, the second thing that he gave them, which is so important that we men give our children, is that when they thought they were down and out, they learned that they can always come back fighting. That's something that mothers can do, but not nearly as naturally as we do it. It's in our blood. It's in our DNA. So this is a lifeline process. This isn't something that you start when they're 14. That's way too late. This starts when they're making their first decisions in life, when they're deciding that they can move their body from there to there, you know, little decisions. And, and as you watch fathers in these situations, they're very good at titrating reality and controlling how much reality and how much risk comes into that kid's life. If there's a set of stairs there or there's a little cliff right here, the father's going to be the one that, that very effectively steps in and controls these risks. But it's also the father that says, all right, you're ready for the stairs now. And usually the father says it before the mother is comfortable with it. And the reason we do these things, I'm convinced of it. You know, I, I have not been able to find many studies on this because my profession is not terribly interested in fathers, very interested in mothers. But I'm convinced that the reason we do this so naturally is so that when we're challenging our little one to handle the stairs, and to handle outlets and to handle all these little dangers that are in the world that we're building in them a set of skills that carries forward so that when they are 14 and they're facing Instagram and smartphones and sex and drugs, they have this set of skills for managing the risk because they've learned how to do it from, from, time, you know, from the time they were a little one. Now there are moments when we get to step in and rescue. That's the other bright side of this, is that yes, we're always making them a little uncomfortable, and eh, not always, but we're typically making them a little uncomfortable, allowing them to sit with some risk and danger in the world, but there are times when we get to be Superman. And it only happens when we've done the first part of this job correctly. I'll give you a story. When I was um, about 10 years old, I had a cousin that was about 16, she lived in Kansas, and I would go out there for the summer sometimes, and she had gotten her driver's license of course, she was real proud of that. And we decided one night, well, they decided, I'm 10, I wasn't deciding anything, but they decided one night we're all going to go to a drive-in, just the kids. She was going to drive, and all of us younger cousins were going to go with her. And I don't remember, know if you uh, remember old drive-ins or what they look like, but you picture a big parking lot, and there's a, a big uh, movie theater screen up there. And then in the parking lot, at intervals, there are these heavy metal poles, like galvanized steel poles. And on these poles are these big metal speakers. And you'd pull up next to a pole close to it, and you'd reach out and you'd grab the speaker, and you'd hang it on your window so that you could hear the audio for the movie. So the movie ends, and we're pulling out, and she's at the wheel, obviously, and she starts to turn, and we hear this long metallic scrape right along the back of the car, the back door and the back quarter panel. And you know what happened? She turned too close, and, or turned too tight, and she hit that metal pole and made a, a really big scratch right down the 
scratch end down right down the side of the car. And this was my uncle's car. And my uncle, very big masculine man, booming voice, kind of a stern father, she was distraught. She didn't know what to do about this. So we went home. We had this pact of secrecy. Nobody was going to tell my uncle like that was going <laughs> to... I was going to fix it somehow. Maybe we'd wake up the next morning and the, the dent fairies will have taken care of it. I don't know, I don't know what we were thinking. But uh, he woke up the next morning and, of course, he found it. And he didn't know what happened, but he knew who did it. And so he went to my cousin and she's distraught. She's in tears. She hasn't slept all night. She has no idea what to do with this situation. And my uncle, the stern man, what do you think he did? Put his arm around her. It's all right. It's just a car. And I don't know why he responded that way, because I've never asked him about it. But I have to imagine that he saw two things, the kind of things that I see in my daughter sometimes. Number one, she was at such an emotional level that there was nothing he could possibly add. Like anything he added would have just added to the sense of misery and failure that was overcoming her. She felt horrible. He didn't want to add to that. There's no value in adding to that. And the second thing is that she really had no way to solve this problem. She's 16. She's making three bucks at the Tasty Freeze or whatever, and she would have had to work for weeks, maybe months, to come up with enough money to, to do this body work. And it's, it's really not an option for her to do that. So my uncle, in his wisdom, I think he saw this, this high level of emotion, and I think he saw that the problem was beyond her solution, and so her ability to solve it. And so he gets to step in and be the hero. And it was kind of a nice moment for them. I think it was a moment that, that um, kind of shaped their relationship. It was one of those turning point moments where she was going from a kid to an adult, and she's learning that, you know what, no matter what, the old man's going to be here, and I can depend on him. Now, my daughter right now is 12, and in my imagination, my 12-year-old daughter has a, has a tachometer right here on her forehead, and it's an emotional tachometer, and I can see how emotional she is based on where the needle is, and she's a girl, so she tends to idle a little fast, and she's uh, emotionally, she tends to be pretty and buoyant and happy, effervescent, loud, but she can very quickly turn to upset, uh, concerned, anxious. She tends to be a little high strung. And me being the father, I'm okay with letting her emotional tachometer start to rev over to like seven, eight, nine thousand, because I know that even if she's getting emotional, she can still usually solve problems. I've lived with her for 12 years and I've got a sense of where her line is. I don't like it when she redlines, when she starts getting up to 12,000 RPM emotionally, because I know that when that hits, She's immobilized. She can't solve problems at that point. So I have learned when she's approaching that red line, that's when I need to be attentive and I need to start maybe offering solutions and rescuing and helping her through that. And um, the mom, my wife, a beautiful woman, I've noticed that, I, I don't know if she sees the same tachometer that I do, but I've noticed that she tends to want to intervene at around 3,000 RPM, much lower level because she has that wonderful mothering instinct to create a safe and comfortable and nurturing environment. So this, at times, has been a little point of contention between us, but not really, because we talk about it. And these are conversations that you don't want to have when little Timmy is on the top row or the top rung of the monkey bars, because it's a high-tense, high-stakes situation. They're conversations that you want to have uh, over dinner, you know, when things are calm, when nobody's in danger. And she and I have this, this little uh, metaphor, well, it's mostly me, it's in my head. It might be like the imaginary tachometer, but I'm the sales department of the company, right? And, she, and I'm the boss. And she's the, she's the accounting department. So sales department is out in the world, killing things, bringing them back, having fun. And, and the accounting department is a little more risk averse, a little more conservative. And my wife's pretty cool. She's not, she's not too risk averse. She's actually pretty tolerant to me letting the kiddo struggle a little bit. But we have these two forces. We have the risk takers and we have the, the, the safety oriented people. So we have risk and safety. And they're wonderful together because either one, too much of either one is, is not a great thing because you have too much of the risk 
takers and, and too much of the willingness to just let your kid beat up, get beat up by the world and overwhelmed by the world, what you end up with is one kind of helplessness. It's called learned helplessness, where a kid learns that no matter what I try, I'm going to fail, I'm going to get beat up, and so they become immobilized by that and they stop trying. Then on the other end, the conservative end, you have a different kind of helplessness, and this is the helplessness of overprotection. This is the person who never learns how to take a risk because they've always been protected. And that's an entirely different kind of helplessness, and it's very dangerous because they go out into the world and they get their ass kicked in a really unpleasant way. You know, they wind up knocked up or, or on drugs or they, they, get, they succumb to these challenges that they were never prepared to handle. And so when you have the sales department and the accounting department working together, it's a beautiful thing. And I'm always, always of the mindset that if the accounting department is saying, those guys are a bunch of idiots, they're just, all they do is they just want to have fun and they, all they, they're just, they have no attenuation to risk management. They're, they're sinking the ship. If the accounting department is saying that about the sales department, more often than not, that's a failure on behalf of the sales department because they never articulated the mission. Now, sometimes the sales department articulates the mission and the accounting department doesn't listen. Then that's a problem on behalf of the sales department. But when they're working together, what you have is this wonderful balance. What your children need from you is to trust this instinct and to refine it because she's not going to get it. She's not predisposed to get it any more than I can understand why my wife wants to intervene when my daughter's revving at 3,000 RPM. Let her solve the problem. Like It's beyond me why she wants to intervene that. But I love that about her. I love that nurturing nature. She doesn't get it why I want to let my daughter struggle as much as I do. And you know, I'm never going to let her get hurt. I'm always going to be the safety net. But I'm, I, she doesn't get that about me. And worse than that, we live in this culture where there are organized forces telling you that this instinctual thing that you bring, that what you are, that your male DNA is toxic by nature. Is anybody here a member of the American Psychological Association? I'm not. I don't see any hands, so I think that makes zero in this room. The American Psychological Association wrote this uh, report, a set of guidelines earlier in the year. I'll talk about them in a minute, but you know, that, that's one set of forces working against us and working against our masculinity. Anybody here have a closet full of delightful Gillette products? I don't. I used to. And by the way, I'm not boycotting them. They're boycotting us. And so... Uh, that's fine because it turns out there's a lot of great alternatives out there. But let me talk about this APA thing for a minute. I've been very vocal. Some of you have mentioned that you've seen my videos about the American Psychological Association. I don't like their report um, or their, their set of guidelines for working with men and boys because essentially what they have done is they've said that masculine traits and masculine instincts are toxic. They amount to a mental health disorder. And in their guidelines, they actually had a couple of good and useful things. Like one of the useful things they did was they gave a nod to fatherhood. And they cited some of the data out there that says that children who have involved and attached fathers do better in life from beginning to end. They do better in math classes. They do better with um, avoiding drugs. And they do better with their families. And they do better in school. They just do better. They excel everywhere when the father is present. But then the same organization turns around and says the traits that create those outcomes are bad. And why do they do that? Well, part of it is because they're shameless ideologues. But another part is that I don't think they understand. I don't think they understand what we are. I don't think they understand what we bring to our children. I think they look at outcomes and they say, well, that's nice, but they're not really piecing together what it is about us. I'll give you an example of something they don't understand. Um, a lady came into my office a few, you know, several years ago, and she asked me this question, and she wasn't really upset about it, but she was very curious about it. She noticed that uh, her husband had this habit of getting her children revved up before bed and then expecting them to go to bed. And I, I was gone a few minutes ago. I think that uh, George talked a little bit about this, but she was really curious about, wh about what this behavior is. Like, why does a man get children revved up with lots of horseplay and lots of activity, and then expect them to calm down. And so she started asking her friends, 
And their husbands did it too. And they started to get stymied about it. And she came to me with this question and said, why do you people do this? And I said, I don't know. But let me go, let me go check it out. I'll, I'll see if I can find an answer. So I looked and I looked and I looked. And it turned out that there had actually been a study on this. And the reason men do this, the thinking, is that we're teaching emotional regulation. This, that this isn't just some... Um, destructive thing that we're doing to our children when we get them revved up and expect them to change gears. When we take them from high energy to low energy and we walk them through that process, we're teaching them how to manage their emotions out there in the world. And this is a very important lesson. And clearly it's not a lesson that, that mothers are as predisposed to give them. They give them wonderful other things, but they don't give them this. And right now, I guarantee you, there's some guy in India, what time is it now? Some guy in India getting his children all revved up before bed and aggravating his wife and then expecting them to calm down because he understands at, at a molecular level how to be a father. We need you, your children need you to refine this instinct and to trust this instinct. And by the way, um, Ken Curry, and I will be doing a workshop later. Ken is a therapist in Denver, top-notch clinician, and he's going to be talking a little bit about how to, how to refine this instinct and how to listen to this instinct, particularly if you didn't have the greatest role models to teach you how to do this. And um, I'll talk a little bit about managing the anxiety that shows up in your household because whether you like it or not, you are the managers of anxiety and emotion in your household. More importantly, we'll just be talking to you and, and you guide the conversation. But um, if you want to come to the workshop, that's what we'll be discussing. She's going to question you. The culture is going to question you. APA is going to question you. Gillette's going to question you. But we need you to follow, your children need you to follow this instinct. Um, one last quick story here. Some of you know, because you've mentioned it to me, that uh, I co-host a little call-in show. And a couple weeks ago, this is to help guys like, manage risk and, and avoid making wrecks of their lives. A couple weeks ago, a lady called in with a cautionary tale, and she was a mother. And the situation was that her 19-year-old son had gotten engaged to a 28-year-old woman. And the concern that this mother had, being a protective, nurturing mother, doing a wonderful job and, and wanting to warn the rest of the world about this, is that she noticed that um, this woman who had gotten her hooks into her son didn't have any interest in being a wife, didn't have any interest in having a husband. I mean, she probably liked the idea of it, but that wasn't what she was after. She wanted a wedding day, and she wanted children. And her son had fallen into this, almost fallen into this trap. Turned out that he, he, saw the, you know, he saw the warning signs early enough to get out. But as the conversation unfolded, the question came up, what does your son's father think about this situation? And she said, well, his father says he'll figure it out. And I wanted to track this guy down and say, you big stupid dummy. Your kid, 19, his brain has not grown in yet. He's about to get thrown to the wolves, and you're completely disengaged. Gosh, I wonder how this happened. Your kids need you to stay engaged with you. They need you to stay engaged with this process of guiding them through the dangers of the world because they're everywhere. And they need you to have fun with it, too, because this is another beautiful aspect of this is that it's a wonderful experience. It's a lot of fun. And I tell you, the folks at the APA and the, the uh, director that made the Gillette commercial and all those nannies and all those gender studies professors, if there's one thing they can't stand is to see men like us having fun. <laughs> it's the best revenge. So I think that um, that wraps it up for me. And I hope to see some of you after lunch. And uh, thank you for the time. What he represents is patriarchy. We're here to do work as men, as patriarchs. There's nothing more natural than being a father.